How many of you are ready to decree? Listen, we want to say to the devil, we didn't start this fight, but we can end it. We want to say to the devil, our weapons may appear to be unorthodox, but effective. Amen? Stand with me, please. In the book of Job, chapter, chapter 22, verse 28, the Bible says, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall come to pass. Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall come to pass. I want everybody to permeate the atmosphere with your voice. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, we loose upon Satan and his headquarters and strongholds and his orders, his plans, his curses, and his demons, we loose the curse of the Midianites. We loose the curse of the Ammonites. We loose the curse of the Moabites. We loose the curse of the Edomites. Second Chronicles 20. Let panic, frustration, havoc, confusion, pandemonium, Disaster, chaos, destruction upon each one of his demonic hosts. We loose the harness of the Lord. Let the harness of the Lord descend upon this building and strike the enemy in his weak areas. We stand on the word of the Lord. Exodus chapter 23, verse 28. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 20. May the wrath, hatred, angels, terror, fear of God, thing of God, the burning judgment, warring angels, and the word of God prevent Satan's orders from being carried out. We decree and declare that this day the perfect will of God will manifest itself. We ask in the name of Jesus, we ask humbly, Father, that you will loose legions of holy angels to fight in the heavenlies, fight in the north, fight in the south, fight in the east, fight in, in the west. One more in the heavenlies. So let them guard us and protect us from Satan and his lies and deception. Now give Jesus a praise. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. You may be seated. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. I ask him to do the decrees because the enemy tried to steal my voice and I wanted to save it for this teaching that God gave me for you all. How many know when you begin to do knock down the enemy, he tries to come back at you. So what this let me know is that we did damage to the kingdom of darkness. And I just give God the honor and the praise. Let me go ahead and pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come before you humbly as I know how, asking you to, to forgive us from all our sins, known and unknownly. Lord, we ask right now that you will come into this place and you will finish what you started. Lord, we pray right now today that, Lord, that you would dispatch your holy angels to stand shoulder to shoulder to fight for us tonight. Now, Lord, you said in your word in John, the third chapter, verse 30, I must decrease so you must increase. So I step aside and move all of Jean out of the way and give you full course to minister to your people. Now, Holy Spirit, I bless you tonight. And I honor you, and I will be very careful to give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. And to our Zoomers out there, thank you again for tuning in. Get your pencils and papers together because I have plenty of scriptures in Jesus' name. Again, I ask the Holy Spirit again, what will he have for Lake Hamilton Bible Camp? I was in my room walking, going to the bathroom, and I heard stupor, 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 S-T-U-P-O-R. I'm like, what? What is stupor? Stupor spirit. It's a slumber spirit. And God began to deal with me about how the United States is in a slumber stupor spirit. A lot of the people don't understand what is going on right now. A lot of them confused. If you ask them, they have a stare at you like they don't know if they're going or coming. And if we really look at our president, he have that look on his face as well. And I am reminded that he is the leader of the United States of America. So what flows down from the head is flowing down to America. So God wants us to be aware of what is going on, and he wants America to come out of the slumber, stupor spirit. So God is about to do a new thing to those who are open to be able to move in signs and wonders and be able to know that he is God all alone. And what is happening in America, he, it has not caught him by surprise. And what he won't and demand from us tonight is to be able to do damage to the kingdom of darkness. We cannot be afraid to come after the enemy. One thing I have learned about this walk, when you begin to tear down the kingdom of darkness, the enemy will try to come and steal and kill from you. So I told the enemy today, bring it on. My husband and I, we are tag team together. We does this for the Lord. And he knows if God do not allow me to finish this teaching, he will come in and he will take over. So again, my teaching is breaking the stupor spirit, which is the slumber spirit. So what is the spirit of stupor? It is a dazed condition of physical and lethargy where the simplest of spiritual truths are unable to arouse. Changes are motivate. It is a condition of diminished or suspended sense of sensibility or a state of mental dullness. And when you look around, you see actually this on people's face. And I don't know if you saw the debate but the president looked like he was in a stupor, slumber spirit. Support words for stupor. Here's some support words. And I'm going to move a little faster. That's why we have Patty doing the recording. <laughs> so the, um, the support words for stupor is bewilder, bewildered, close off, clouded, confused. Darken, daze, depress, dim, dozing, a drained spirit, drowsy, dull, an idle spirit, impaired, indifferent, insensitive, foggy, lethargy, a muddled spirit, slumber, stupor, tired, unclear, unconsciousness, and weary. The Bible warns us against falling into a spiritual coma. We can look like a Christian, but we have dozed off in spiritual and are dying spiritually. When we keep turning a deaf ear or a blind eye to the Holy Spirit and grieve him, by the way we live, God will eventually send us a spirit of slumber to put us to sleep permanently unless we choose to repent. An affliction of spiritual slumber can also manifest physically with symptoms such as falling asleep during sermons. 
Hmm. All of us are guilty of that. Frequent, frequent forgetfulness and constantly feeling lethargy, no matter how much sleep we have had. Let me just add to this. When I was preparing this message, I was tired. I was fatigued. I kept falling asleep. All these things was happening when I just listened, listed to you all. So I know that the enemy didn't want this teaching to go forth because I believe today that most of you are out here. The enemy has attacked you in that area. Even when you read the Bible, you find yourself falling asleep. You can tune in on the television and you can look at something all day and it would not bother you. But as soon as you pick up the word of God, he began to put a spirit, a stupor or slumber upon you. The Bible says in Romans, the 11 chapter, verse 8 through 10, that's Romans, the 11 chapter, verse 8 through 10. God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear until this day, verse 9. And David says, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them, verse 10. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down they back away. So he has put a spirit of slumber that you have eyes, but you cannot see, but you have ears, but you cannot hear. The spirit of stupor has attached itself to the world and begun to take root in generations after generations. As a result, these evil spirits have established a strongholds in the lives of the people. Many are locked in a stupor state and their minds are consciously in confusion. People are assaulted one another physically, verbally, as a way of life, as this is the natural way to do. Also, we are living in darkness in this world today. All around us, we can see that it's so much darkness. And God is saying, something is wrong here. My people cannot see. My people cannot wake up and see. I have given them eyes, but they cannot see. I have given them ears, but they cannot hear what the Spirit is saying to them today. The Bible says in Luke, the 21st chapter, verse 34 through 35, that's Luke, the 21st chapter, verse 34 through 35. And take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be un overcharged with surfeiting, which means indulgence and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares, verse 35. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted and worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man. Pray that you will be able to escape these things. Some of you the spirit of stupor, the spirit of slumber has attached itself to you. You don't realize it, but I'm here to tell you tonight, God is ready to release that off of you. If you are willing to go forth and say, it's me, I've been attacked by the stupor and the slumber spirit because God wants your eyes to be open. He wants your ears to be open as well to see what is going on upon this earth and be able to stand. So let's talk about some evidence of a spirit of slumber. When we fall asleep spiritually, as our hearts are stuffed with the things of this world, all the things of the world, we, our mind are stuffed with it, rather than God's word and his spirit. The Bible says in Romans, the 13th chapter, verse 11 through 14. That's Romans, the 13th chapter, verse 11 through 14. And that... Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now, it is our salvation nearer than when we believe. 
12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Verse 13. Let us walk earnestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and unruly, and not in strife and in envying. So what are some symptoms of it? Dullness. So what is dullness? Dullness does. Hearts that can discuss God's word intellectually, but do not understand his saving truths and therefore forfeit his saving grace and healing as a result. The spirit of deafness follow this. So what does this do? Hearts that hear Bible teachings, but lack the ability to understand spiritual truths and mature in faith are discerned between good and evil and right and wrong. Also the stupid spirit, a blindness come with it. Remember, they had eyes, but they cannot see. So hearts that sees God's teachings and works, but are blocked from experiencing God's personal salvation and the power through the Holy Spirit. So there's a blockage there that causes you to be blind in the spirit realm, where you have eyes that you cannot see, and also a deafness that you have ears, but you cannot hear anything, and also a dullness that come over you that you cannot understand the truth. Ezekiel, the 12th chapter, verse 2. That's Ezekiel, the 12th chapter, verse 2. And it says, Son of man, thy dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and they hear not, for they are of a rebellious house. So it's safe to say that a spirit of stupor, a spirit of slumber, is a rebellious spirit. When we are not alert, sober-minded, or prepared, Satan will come like a thief to rob us of God's abundant life. Those in Christians don't resist the devil or put up a fight. You just let him walk all over you, do whatever he please, and then you complain about it. The Bible says in John, the 10th chapter, verse 10, the thief come not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it abundantly. The devil come to steal, kill, and destroy, but God said something different. But what has happened, we have accepted it, the steal, the kill, and all of these things from the enemy, and we don't see that God has an abundant life for us. The Bible says in James, the fourth chapter, verse seven, that's James, the fourth chapter, verse seven, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If you resist him, he will flee. So let's talk about some examples how the enemy come in through the stupor spirit from day to day life. Number one, we struggle to believe everything that is in the Bible. We struggle to believe it. We go tip for tap, we argue the Bible, what God said, what he didn't say. Number two, we start to feel drowsy whenever we start to read the Bible or listen to sermons, but not when we engage in other activities. Are we alert with those? Number three, our prayers, our worship songs feel like lip service and do not move our hearts. But I'm reminded of that scripture that the word of God says, many worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In other words, you talk a good game, you sing a good song, but your heart is not in it. Number four, we feel disconnected from God when a stupor or a slumber spirit is attached to you. Number five, we cannot see visions or dreams or prophetic dreams. A lot of times I'm talking to people, they say, I never have a dream. I never dream. How could you never dream? God always speaking. I'm dreaming all the time. Every time I dream, 
we better believe before that week is out, it's coming to pass. He speaks to me through his dreams. Number six, we lack passion for God's word. We don't have the passion for his word, but we got the passion for everything else. But when it comes to God, oh, I don't feel like reading the word today. I get to it. It'll be two weeks before you get to that one scripture. His kingdom and his will is what we need to be after. Number seven, we are stuck with fleshly patterns of the world. We have become conformed to this world. And God is saying, wake up, my people. And if you don't wake up, what will happen to you? A spirit of stupor will we will allow to come upon you. His words say he will allow it to come upon you. So guess what? If you put it upon you, then they're going to take him to take it off of you. The spirit of stupor or slumber can cripple the entire church. There are churches. You can walk in them churches and they're sitting there like zombies. You come in one way and you leave the same way. Are you even messed up even more? The spirit of stupor or slumber is on the church. And they're going on talking about we got the power. God is sick and tired of that. They are weak in their faith. They don't, they don't exemplify the power of Christ and aren't able to speak God's truth boldly. He's calling us to be bold. It's time to let the lion roar again. Wake up. They are neither hot or cold. The Bible says in Revelation, the third chapter, verse 15 through 16. That's Revelation, the third chapter, verses 15 through 16. I know that works, that they are neither cold nor hot. So God is saying, oh, I already know they work. See, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can fool me none of the time. So wake up out of your stupor slumber spirit. Slumbering Christians abuse the mighty name of Jesus Christ through indifferences and rejects God's power in their lives. The most disturbing fact about dozing lukewarm Christians is that, that, that God has already considered them dead. That's powerful. You mean to tell me that a stupor, slumber spirit that is upon you, God already see you as dead. The Bible says in Revelation, the third chapter, verse one, was a message to the Sardis church, which is a message to you right now. And what he is saying is, I know that works, that they have a name that they live, but they are dead. You apostle this and prophet this and evangelist that, but you are dead. You have a stupor and a slumber spirit. And when the spirit of slumber and stupor come upon you, God sees you at dead, meaning that he will not recognize you. Because I'm reminded of the word of God. The dead know not what the living do. So when you're dead, you don't know what's going on. Okay, I'm going to slow down a little bit. God is patient and gracious, unshakable in his love for us. He loves us now. He really do. It is why he keeps knocking on the door of our hearts and gives us many opportunities to turn back to him. He's knocking. He's knocking. It is only when we repeatedly choose to follow the dark ways of this world instead of him that he eventually removes his light from our hearts. So the light can be removed from our hearts. The Bible says in John, the third chapter, verse 19 through 21. That's John, the third chapter, verse 19 through 21. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds was evil. For everyone that does evil hated the light, 
We that come through the light, must to do should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, and that they are wrought in God. So we should love the light. We should desire the light. I think it was Sister Callie that said she had on a shirt, and her shirt was saying something about, how can I pray for you? And the man saw the light in her. Do God see the light in you? Do people see the light in you? It's time for people to see the light in us. We got work to do. We got work to do. It's no time for foolishness. And this is not a playing game. This is something that we should be doing right now, running for Jesus Christ. Anything that's in our hearts, we should be saying, Lord, move it. I want none of this. None of this. Amen? So here are some examples of the stupor spirit. Number one, they're numbing their self in response to emotional pain. So when you are under a stupor or slumber spirit, you are numbing yourself in response to emotional pain. You feel nothing. Just as physical coma is a response to the brain and injury, spiritual coma can be related to our emotional injuries. Rather than go to God to confess our pain and ask him for comfort, healing, and rest, we know we long sustain pain by spacing out, refusing to feel, or distracting ourselves instead of hearts that are soft and tender, we heart in our heart, we go into a sort of deep freeze emotionally. The Bible says in Matthews, the 11th chapter, verse 28 through 30, that's Matthews, the 11th chapter, verse 28 through 30, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek, which means gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Meaning there's nothing hard about me. First Peter, the third chapter, verse 8. That's first Peter, the third chapter, verse 8 says, Finally, be all of one mind. Having compassion, one another. Love as brethren. Compassion, being courteous. The teachings have been on one accord this weekend. Kelly and I talked about love. I talked about the glory. You talked about the Holy Spirit. And my husband talked about everything. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Some of us Trying to sleep as, as normal mechanism, turning off the lights, so to speak, in order to escape the stress. Instead of bringing him to Jesus, you try to escape from him. Rather than offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, we train our bodies in sense to switch off and to go into a place of unconsciousness. Over the years, a spirit of slumber will take root and enslave you, sending you to sleep at any opportunity, particularly when the word of God is being preached. The Bible says in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 1, that's Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, presenting everything to him, because he knows how to do it. But when we try to do it on our own, we go into a sleep, a slumber, and experience a stupor. Because we refuse to give it to him. The Bible says in Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 16. That's Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, 
whose servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So whoever or whatever you yield yourself to, that's who you obey. So if you yield yourself to the devil, you obey him. But if you yield yourself to God, you obey him. Hallelujah. So people numbs themselves temporary relief or momentary highs. Some people turn to alcohol, some turn to drugs. Workaholism, where people just work, 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 work. Pornography. As we continue to choose self-rule and self-comfort, God will eventually give us over to our choices. The message is this. Whatever you choose, because he gives us choices, that's what you become. The Bible says in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 17 through 19, that's Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 17 through 19. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkening by alienating from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So you see them as ignorance because the blindness of their heart who being past feelings having given themselves over into a lasciviousness to work all uncleansedness with greediness. So he turns you over to all of that. This was happened. When we lose touch with God and with reality and can't think straight anymore, we fall into all sorts of perversions. All of these sorts of things that we open the door and we allow these perversions to come in. As we shut our hearts down, our minds and bodies also starts to suffer. Because when you shut down, your body suffers. You open the door to sickness, disease, infirmities, all of these things. We begin to grow exhausted from holding down our emotions and carrying the heavy burdens of our sins. We carry the heavy burdens of our sins. When the Bible said, cast in every care at my feet because I care for you. Then you say, the burden is not yours, it's mine, says the Lord. So I'm reminded that the, the scriptures have to come alive in you. We can't just recite them, we have to practice them. Wow. Our bodies experience unexplainable aches and pains when we shut down our bodies when we start to suffer. The Bible says in Psalms, the 38 chapter, verse 3 through 8. That's Psalms, the 38 chapter, verse 3 through 8. And it reads, there is no soundness in my flesh because of thy anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. Wound stinks and are corrupt because of my foolishness. All the things that, 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 that a person does, they open themselves up to all of these foolishness things. I am troubled. This is what song saying. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go moaning all the day long. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble, and I am sore and broken, and I have roar by reason of this quietness of my heart. Wow. You need to study that. Number two, unconfessed sins is another door that opened to you the spirit of stupor, that's unconfessed sins. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse four, that's 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse four, and whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them, which believe not, 
lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So his light cannot shine if you have unconfessed sin in your life. We try to soothe our guilty conscience by watering down God's word and quenching the Holy Spirit. We run away to indulge in various activities that bring fleshly relief. But they will decrease. Eventually, the Holy Spirit will leave us to stumble around in our spiritual darkness. The Bible says in Proverbs, the fourth chapter, verse 18 through 19, that's the Proverbs, the fourth chapter, verse 18 through 19, excuse me, but the path of the just, which is the righteous, is as the shining light. So the righteous have a shining light that shine more and more into the perfect day. The way of the wicked is darkness that know not at what they stumble. They don't realize that they are stumbling, that they are falling, that they're in a stumble, slumber state. Number three, here's another reason why you're in a stumble, uh, a stupor, a slumber state. Choosing falsehood and lies. Choosing falsehood and lies. We cannot blind ourselves by accepting whatever we are told by Christian teachers, our prophets, without testing it with the Holy Spirit. Let me read that again. We cannot blind ourselves by accepting, by accepting whatever we are told by Christian teachers or prophets without testing it with the Holy Spirit. We fall for falsehoods that dim our spiritual understanding. We can do this by picking the pastor, the church, devotionals, and Bible resources that sound right for our flesh, that makes us feel good. Rather than diligently study the Bible for ourselves and asking the Holy Spirit to lead us to truth. This is a picture of spiritual slothfulness. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, the 11 chapter, verse 4, that's 2 Corinthians, the 11 chapter, verse 4, and this scripture is coming out of the New Living Testament because I love the way they put it. We happily put up with whatever anyone tells you. Even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one we believe. So in other words, Whatever they say to make you feel good, you accept it. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verse 3 through 5. And 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verse 3 through 5. And I'm also coming out of the New Living because I like the way they put it as well. It says, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want them to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths, things that's not true. But we should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering from the Lord. Look at telling others the good news and fully carrying out the ministry God has given you. Read, study for yourself. You know, when we're in church and the pastor is preaching, and whatever he say, you hear the people, amen, pastor. Amen, pastor. Are you following what he said, what he's reading? Because amen means you're agreeing. You're in agreement with whatever he said. Wow. <laughs> the Bible says in John, the 16th chapter, verse 13, that's John, the 16th chapter, verse 13, and it reads, and this is coming out of the King James Version. How about when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. 
but he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall show you things to come. He will guide you. He will show you if you trust him in all truth. This is how many Christians have allowed Satan, who often disguises himself as a minister of spiritual guide, to slowly lead them into falsehood because we have not stayed alert and tested the spirits. Satan does not need to openly attack or challenge church or communities. He simply rules the spiritual complacement into a stupor. He already has them where he wants them. He don't need to do anything else. So that we are no longer a threat to his evil schemes. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, chapter verse 13 through 15, that's 2 Corinthians 11, chapter verse 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. It's here. We're in this time where the fake is here. The false is here. Number 14, and no marvel, but Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Number 15, therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transferred as the ministers of righteousness, whose end should be according to their works. The day will come that God will judge them. And the works that they've done and how they fooled the people, they will pay a price for it. So if you're one of these pastors, prophets, fivefold ministers that is deceiving God's people, you will pay the price for it. If he entrusted you with his people, he entrusts you to lead them and guide him according to the word of God. The Bible says in 1 John, the fourth chapter, verse 1 to 3. That's 1 John, the fourth chapter, verse 1 to 3. Beloved. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirit whether they are God. Because many false prophets are going out into the world. They are going out. They're still there now. This is what the word is saying. They are here. Number two, hereby know ye the spirit of God. The spirit that confess that Jesus Christ come into the flesh is of God. Number three. And every spirit that confess not that Jesus Christ is coming to the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of the Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, even now already is it in the world. It's here. Satan can also lead us into falsehood by tempting us to lie habitually, either to others, to ourselves, or both. The devil tries to fill us with fear so that we are afraid of telling the truth. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, the first chapter, the first chapter, verse 7, God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. So if God didn't give you the spirit of fear, who gave it to you? All of us have fictions, innocence, ignorance, and indifference at some point in life. All of us have. To deal with stressful emotions or to get out of trouble. We may have even told outright lies, outright lies. As we grow older, we learn to sugarcoat our lies by calling them just a white lie. Half truths, alternative realities are another way of looking at things and make it part of our normal behavior. So you're accepting half truths. The Bible says in John, the eighth chapter, verse 44, you belong to the devil, the father of lies. The Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, will not tolerate anyone who lies. The Bible says a liar will not tarry in his sight. You don't deal with liars. 
as we keep shutting our eyes to the truth, we go spiritually blind permanently. This is what can happen to us. The Bible says in John, the 15th chapter, verse 26. That's John, the 15th chapter, verse 26. But when the comforter comes, which is the Holy Spirit, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. So you will know that it's him. You will know the truth. Why? Because the Bible says he will testify. That's who he is. Ooh, moving right along. Number four, the spirit of stupor also deals with idol worship also in our families. So write down idol worships in our families. When we participate in temples, rituals, shrines of a loved one, consulting fortune tellers, eating food offered to idols and idol worships, this opened the doors to demonic spirits, a curse of blindness and confusion of mind attaches itself to you and falls on your entire family. And when this happens, your spiritual eyes remain closed and mind stay shut. The Bible says our forefathers have sinned and we have borne their iniquities. So what they have done down back way then, it has come down to us and we have borne their iniquities. But here's the thing. We have the right to not receive what they have done. We don't have to claim the curse. We have the right. Amen? You have the right. You don't have to accept that. If your mother died of cancer, you don't have to die of cancer. You don't have to receive that. I hear people say, well, my mom died of pancreatic cancer, and you know, we're going to have to be careful that that spirit don't come down on us. No, 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 it ain't no spirit going to come down. You have to refuse that. He have given you the authority. What I'm saying to you today is quit letting the enemy walk all over you when God has given you the tools and he have given you the victory. The Bible says in Isaiah, the 44th chapter, verse 17 through 18, that's Isaiah, the 44th chapter, verse 17 through 18, and the residue thereof, he makes a God, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it and worship it and pray unto it and pray unto it and say, deliver me. Huh? For thy are my God. Now, verse 18, they have not known nor understood, but he has shut their eyes that they cannot see and their hearts they cannot understand. So the gods and the idols and all these things that they have indulged in, they became their God. They can't see. They have accepted that. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, verses 15, and then we're going to skip down to 28 through 29. But Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, verse 15 says, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Move down to 28. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. He hates the idols. Verse 29. And thou shalt walk at noonday as the blind walk in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spared evermore, and no man shall save thee. These curses will come down on you. You hear people say, I can't never prosper. It seems like my neighbors over here, they make it a day. I mean, they're doing well. It seems like nothing is coming my way. Nothing. Could it be that you have an idol that is stopping the blessings? An idol. Yes, it could be. Any believer who chooses to follow Jesus Christ will not be participants with demons. They will not participate with the demons. You don't have time for that. I'll be yoked to people who worship idols. 
we forget that this is a form of spiritual prostitution and that God will not tolerate adulterous people. If we refuse to turn away from worship of idols that have no breath, wow, of power, we will eventually be put to sleep. Why would you want to worship an idol that don't have any breath? That cannot bring life into you. Bible says in 1 Corinthians to Tim chapter verse 20. That's 1 Corinthians to Tim chapter verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I will not that you shall have fellowship with devils. He said, do not have fellowship with devils. Here's another scripture. 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verse 16. That's 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? What agreement he has with nothing. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, if you fall in him, but not the idols. Jeremiah, the 51st chapter, verse 17 says, Every man is brutish by his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graving image, but his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. It can do nothing for you. Number five, and I'm moving right along, I don't have much. Another spirit, stupor spirit that can follow you is covenants with death. A stupor and a slumber spirit also carry covenants with death. One other way we are overcome by spiritual slumber is by agreeing to choosing death over life. We can make a covenant with death simply by thinking thoughts such as, it is better for everyone if I'm not around anymore. That's making a covenant with death. I wish God would take me to heaven early. That's making a covenant with death. Life is painful. Death is peaceful. Dying is better than living. That's making a covenant with death. This gives evil spirits the green light to consent our permission to come against us at any point in our lives. The Bible says in Isaiah, the 28th chapter, verse 15, that's Isaiah, the 28th chapter, verse 15, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death. Then let's go to Isaiah, the 29th chapter, verse 10. That's Isaiah, the 29th chapter, verse 10 says, for the Lord had poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and had closed your eyes because of the stupor slumber spirit that you have taken on. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, verse 15 through 17, that's Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, verse 15 through 17, and I'm coming out the ESV because it broke it down plainly. And it says, see, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and keeping and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you should live and multiply. You should live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you were not here, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you should surely perish. That's the word of God. He hates idols. Sometimes our agreements with death can be harmless as singing along the songs with lyrics that glorify death, or fantasizing about death. Many Christians are unaware that they also yoke themselves to a spirit of slumber by admiring zombies. Have you ever seen, I love zombie movies. Role-playing certain characters that glorify death, participating in games of sorcery to exchange souls or call upon dark powers. Rather than admiring Jesus and choose the abundant life, 
he has prepared for each one of us, we blindly dabbled with the occult and death. The deeper we dab into such activities, the more the light of life in our spirits is snuffed off. The Bible says in John, the 10th chapter, verse 10, and you all know this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Bible also said in John, the 8th chapter, verse 12, they spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follow me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. If you follow him, you will have the light of life because he is the light. And I'm almost about to close. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. Most of us fall into spiritual slumber as a result of deception. Without a clear-headed and unfiltered understanding of God's word. We can all easily go astray and fall prey to an evil spirit of slumber. We can all fall prey. To regain lost ground, it is crucial that we are prepared to fight for our souls and remove all the footholds that the demonic spirits of slumber have used to slip in on us. We're in a fight for our souls. And not only for our own as an individual, but for our families. They need us. Some of them are lost. They don't understand. They don't know. We're in a fight for our families. And it's time for you to put on a good fight for yourself and your family. Amen. Okay, I'm getting ready to close. This is the last of it. So how do we overcome the spirit of stupor or slumber? How do we overcome this? Number one. First, confess and repent to God for forsaking him. Because that's what you pretty much did. You forsaked him. You went after other gods. You went after other idols. And you forsake our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So now you need to repent and ask him to forgive you for forsaking him. The Bible says in Revelation, the second chapter, verse four through five, that's Revelation, the second chapter, verse four through five. Nevertheless, I have someone against thee because thy have left thy first love. Verse five, remember therefore from whence thy are falling and repent and do the first works or else I will come into thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. He will remove himself from you. The light will be taken away. Number two, seek godly counseling. God-fearing men and women, if you got a problem, any type of emotional injuries, whatever you're going through, seek a good Bible-based counselor. The Bible says in Proverbs, the 12th chapter, verse 18, that's Proverbs, the 12th chapter, verse 18, there is that speak like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. So there are good people that can help you. Number three, Repent of all the sins you have accumulated against uh, yourself and in Jesus' name, such as the idol worships in your family, the covenants of death, the lying spirit, the drunkenness, and the unforgiveness. So number three is repent of all the sins you have accumulated against yourself in Jesus. The Bible says in Romans, the 13th chapter, verse 11 through 12, that's Romans, the 13th chapter, verse 11 through 12, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. So now today is the time to wake up out of sleep. But now it is salvation nearer than we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the work of darkness and let us put on the armor of light.
Number four, turn away from a pattern of sinning. Turn away from a pattern of sinning. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 33 to 34. That's 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 33 to 34. And I'm also coming out the ESV because I like the way they put it as well. It says, do not be deceived. Bad company rules, ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right. And do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this is to your shame. Another scripture to support that. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 14 through 15. That's Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 14 through 15 says, Wherefore, he said, Awake thy, thy sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ should give thee light. So come out of the stupor, slumber spirit, and arise, that God will give you light. Verse 15, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So to have a stupor spirit, a slumber spirit, is walking as fools. So what I gave you, what number was that? One, two, three, four, five, five. Here's another one. Study God's word carefully so you remain in his light. Study God's word carefully so you remain in his light. And also, stay sober-minded and grow in spiritual maturity and faith and love. Grow in maturity. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 15, that's 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 15, study to show that self approval unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study. And the last one, prayer, praying always. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse 17, that's 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse 17, pray without season. This means not to give up prayer. It means praying continually, even when it doesn't make sense anymore. How many times you done prayed and prayed and prayed and it doesn't make any sense? And the enemy saying you might as well give up, don't even pray anymore because nothing moving. He ain't speaking. And it's not abandoning your faith, but constantly looking to God in all things. Praying without season is repeatedly praying without speaking. It is being consistent and persistent and seeking his will. Lastly, it is imperative that we start, that we stay alert and be accountable and learn to be God-fearing men and women. How many of you ever prayed to be that God-fearing man or woman? If you haven't, you need to start. Because when you are a God-fearing man or woman, you're not going to do any and everything. Because you're going to want to please your Heavenly Father. Because if you do anything, you're going to feel bad about it. Lord, I'm sorry I didn't mean to do that. Please help me do better. Because when you love him, you want to please him. And that's what he wants. He wants all of you, not part of you, all of you. Wake with eyes that sees and ears that hear. The time is here. We stay awake and be watchful. Jesus has repeatedly warned that he can return at any time that we need and we need to be ready. Rather than sleeping and caught off God, there will be no longer or be a second chance at that point. At that point. Ha, huh, my Lord. We will be put under Jesus' judgment and his very sobering warnings in Luke, the 12th chapter, talk about that. That's Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 35 through 37, and also 45 through 48. And last but not least, Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 35. Let's read that through 37. 
Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Let your light always be burning. Verse 36. And ye also, and your and yourself, like unto men that wait for their Lord. When he returns from the wedding, that when he comes and he knock, they may open unto the Lord when he comes. Uh, they may open unto him immediately. Verse 37. Bless are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Last verse, I did say this was the last one. One more verse. Psalms 145, verse 8 through 9. That's Psalms 145, verse 8 through 9 says, The Lord is gracious. He is gracious and full of compassion. So to anger and of great mercy. Verse 9. The Lord is good to all. He's good to all, not some, but all. And his tender mercies are all over his work. Let's give God the praise for the word of God. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. I don't know how to stand in this stretch. And stretch, reach for the stars. Stand no tippy toe. <laughs> in goes the good air. Out goes the bad air. Amen. Come on, stretch a little bit, saints. Miss Ray, we really enjoyed that word. Thank God the way how he used you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated when you... Amen. How many of you are blessed by that word? Well, give Jesus a praise. Amen. Uh, giving honor to God, to the precious Holy Spirit, to the to the precious to Jesus. I'm sorry, to the precious Holy Spirit, to the precious Holy Spirit whom we love, and to all the listeners out there, and to each and every one of you. Um, it's a blessing to. It's an honor to speak with you again. Can you hear me okay? Okay. I want you to turn with me to, let's, let's go right ahead. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. The book of 1 Kings chapter 17. Let's look at verses 1 through 9. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1 through 9. And pull out your pencil and papers because we're going we're gonna to teach also. Okay? That's 1 Kings chapter 17, verses one through nine. Okay. All right. Let's get started. Verse one. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab. Now we know who Ahab was. He was the husband of Jezebel. Okay. All right. Then it says, Has the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand? There shall not be doom. Years, but according to my word. Look at verse 2. And the getting the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Look at verse 3. Get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the book Sharif. The book Sharif, the book Sharif. That is before Jordan. Look at verse 4. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the book, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. All right, so he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the book Sharif that is before Jordan. Now look at verse 6. And the ravens, the ravens, the white bird, ravens are scavengers. And the ravens brought the prophet, 
is what it says. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning. Ravens are scavengers, so we know that they brought him bread and roadkill. <laughs> All right. In the morning, and bread and roadkill in the evening, or bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. Look at verse 7. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up. Look at someone and say, the book dried up. Okay. Because there had been no rain in the land. Two more verses. Verse 8, and the word of the Lord came to him, saying, verse 9, Arise and get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and there, behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to do what? To sustain thee. Many of you know the scriptures, First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, where the Bible says the sons of Issachar or the children of Issachar understood the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. The sons of Issachar, they could read the, 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 the moon cycles. They could read the eclipse. Uh, uh, they understood the Hebrew or the Hebraic calendar. Okay? And they understood the times. And they, and they knew who the next leader would be. And even at this time and season we're in, the children of Ishika should know who the next president of the United States should be. Okay? In Ecclesiastes 3, look at verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. It says these words. It says, to everything there is a what? A season, a time, and what? A purpose. Is that correct? Each one of you are operating in certain transition type seasons or transitional cycles. And I'm going to prove that to you in a few minutes. Okay? So what we're going to use as a subject is this, discerning your season of transition. Discerning your season of what? Transition. Okay? Well, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about the prophet Elijah. And in my notes, I have some character notes that Elijah was a prophet of courage and he was a prophet of confrontation. He was a prophet that would confront you, okay? In other words, he was a spiritual warfare prophet, okay? In other words, he battled the host of hell. Elijah was a committed man. Elijah's ministry was characterized by what? Supernatural manifestation of the spirit and what? And power. Elijah, listen, lived constantly under God's presence and he relied upon God. How many men and women we know at this hour live constantly under God's presence and they totally rely on God? Saints, it's time that we go back to the ancient past. Is that right? We Listen, it's time that we, we be the stores of the breach. Is that right? We need men and women, hello, saints of God, that are committed to God, that rely upon his presence. In other words, they won't make a move until they first acknowledge him. Okay? All right. Elijah was also a man marked by his separation from evil. He didn't want anything to do with evil. Okay, look at someone and say, I want nothing to do with evil. Elijah lived in a time of, of, of spiritual decline and apostasy. Now, doesn't that sound familiar with the United States? Is that right? From the outhouse to the White House. Apostasy. From the ghetto to the Gitmo. Apostasy. Okay, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing a moral and an ethical decline in America right now, of which we love. And Elijah's time was marked by Baal worshipers, and Baal had become a national religion. How many of you are familiar with the pagan god Baal? Uh, how many of you don't want to be familiar with the pagan god Baal? Amen? Okay, well, we're in that time. Well, in America right now, the spirit of Baal is present, especially when we see these sex traffickers and these, these organ snatchers and these child child traffickers, you know, and these abortions that are celebrated to the pagan god Moloch, which is connected with Baal. All right, Elijah was a sent one. What do we mean by sent one? He was sent by Jehovah. 
He was sent by God. And many of you who read your Bibles, you already know that Elijah is going to return again. How many of you are with me, saints? We're talking about the spirit and power of Elijah. Okay? And many deliverance ministers will move in the spirit and under the spirit and power of who? Elijah. Turn to Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. Please forgive me if I'm moving fast. Hey, amen. Amen. My, my, my wife always brought, brought the day, almost brought the daybreak in, so I think I need to, to, to move a little faster. Uh, Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Does everybody see that? I will send you who? Elijah the prophet before the what? Great and terrible day of the Lord. Now turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Correction. The book of Revelation, chapter 11. Okay. Let's look at verses, verses 3. The, the book of Revelation, chapter 11. Let's look at verses 3 to 12. In verse 3, it says, I will give power to my two witnesses. I will give power to my two candlesticks. I will give power to my two anointed ones. Who are they? They are Moses and Elijah. And I'm going to prove it. That they're going to be resurrected. They're going to be brought back in this end time thrust. Look at verse 2. I will give power to my witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in what? Sackcloth. Verse 4. These are my two olive trees. Look, symbolic language in Revelation. And deed and two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Look at verse 5. If any man will hurt them, fire will proceed out of their mouth. My God, fire. How many of you know that the Lord is a consuming fire? Is that right? And how many of you remember last night that God was angry with Miriam, and when he came down, he said what he had to say, and he, and he got out of there immediately because somebody might have been extra crispy. Okay? All right, let's go back to verse 5 again. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devour their enemies, and if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Hear me, saints. We're stepping into some awesome times here. Verse 6, these have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Who we know that prophesied that uh, the, uh, there will be no dew nor rain. It was Elijah. Is that right? And then look what it says. And have power over the waters to turn to them to blood and to smite the earth with plagues as often as they will. Whom do we know that, that was able to do that? Say again, sister. Beautiful sister. Moshe, Moses, is that correct? My God, uh, we got some Bible study people here, personnel here. Amen. Thank you. Look at verse 8. Then it's verse 7, and it says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, okay, and shall overcome them and kill them. Moses and Elijah, kill them. Verse 8, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, spiritually which is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Look at verse 9, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the grave. Something is going to happen, though. Verse 10, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, make merry, and they shall send gifts. Look what it says, one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Now look at verse 11 real closely. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life, the spirit of life, the spirit of life from God, will enter into them, and they will stand upon their feet, and great fear will fall upon them that what saw them. So we see here that Moses and Elijah are going to return again. All right, who did we say the two witnesses were? They shall prophesy. Who, who, who are the symbolic two olive trees? The anointed ones. They shall prophesy. Moses and Elijah. Who are the two candlesticks? Moses and Elijah. Who do we say one was shut will prophesy uh, that there will be no do no rain. We know that was Elijah. And who did we say that was smite with plagues? We said it was who? 
Moses. All right, let's go back to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17. Okay, here we are. Let's go back again, 1 Kings, chapter 17. All right, in verse 1 again, it said that Elijah, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, Has the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand? There shall not be rain nor dew these years, but according to my word. So we see Elijah prophesied prophetically that there will be what? No rain, no dew. So if you don't have any rain or dew, what do you have? You have a drought. Amen? Say with me, a drought. So he prophesied a drought because the land was filled with apostasy. He prophesied a drought because the land was filled with apostasy, the worship of Baal, practices of Baalism, and even the priests of Baal. Saints of God, we are seeing droughts in enormous proportions, not only covering the world, but we're seeing droughts in America. Hear me out. And I believe this is prophetically symbolic. We're seeing these type droughts hit America. Now, there are national droughts. Look what I have in my note. What is a drought? A drought is a period of dryness. What is a drought? A period of dry weather injurious to crops. What is a drought? A prolonged lack of rain and water. What is a drought? A drought of summer. The land will suffer. What is a drought? Parch heat, a dearth, or a drought. That's what a drought is. There are times when God will use droughts. Listen, it's safe for me to say that there are times when God will use weather patterns, hello, saints of God, to bring judgment on a city or bring judgment on a nation or to bring judgment upon the people. How many of you are listening to me? Okay, natural drought. Jehovah will use a drought or weather pattern to get your attention, whether it's a nation, as I said, a city, or, or even a ministry. Hear me out, saints. Or God will use a drought to even get the attention of a ministry. And I'm going to be saying this again. There may be a drought in the finances. There may be a drought in someone's health. There may be a drought in someone's marriage. There may be a drought. Hello, saints of God. There may be a drought in somebody's place of business where there's no creativity flowing or functioning properly. Hear me out. When God sends a drought, he is calling for repentance on a nation, on a land, on a church, because evidently God sees apostasy in that church building, my God, the eight pin. What is prophetic about that? I prophesy the eight pin will restore itself, and by doing that, I will get a new eight pin. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. I'll turn with me to Job chapter 24, verse 19. The book of Job chapter 24, verse 19. How many of you look at how many of you know the devil is mad? Is that right? But who cares? All right, Job chapter 24, verse 19, it says, Drought and heat consume the, the slow waters, so does the grave those that have sinned. My goodness. Drought and heat consume the slow waters, so does the grave those that have what? Sin. I want you to think with me about a drought. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 23. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 23. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass. And the earth that is under thy feet shall be iron. Brass and iron. No dew, no rain. God sitting in a drought. It's prophetic that God is trying to get the attention of the house of the Lord. Or he's trying to get the attention of your marriage. Or he's trying to get the attention of your city. Or, or he, and I know definitely with a drought, he's getting the attention of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. God, look what it says. There, there are droughts, there are weather patterns that God will use. When God is speaking, there are times when we don't want to listen. There are times when we don't want to hear. So God will cause the finances, 
that have a drought. Uh, come on, saints, we're coming from the word of God. He will cause relationships to have a drought. He will cause business. He will cause a city. He will cause government. He will cause leadership to go into a drought. All we've been hearing lately in America is so hot. It's so hot. I took one lady to me. She said, oh, Mr. Weaver, it's just so hot. I said, yes, honey, you can fry an omelet on the sidewalk. It's that hot. Look what it says here. Turn with me to Haggai chapter 1, verse 11. The book of Haggai chapter 1, verse 11. Look what the Lord says, and I call for a drought upon the land. It's his doings. He uses weather patterns. I call for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine. The word says, and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, the plants, the herbs, and upon men, you and I, upon cattle, and upon all the labor of your hands, everything that you put your hands to do. When I can't get your attention, I shall call a drought. When the land of a, a ministry or a marriage or a, a, a business is in apostasy and they're not hearing the voice of God, the Lord says he will call for a drought that will affect the mountain, affect the land, affect the corn, affect the new wine, affect the oil, affect the men, affect the cattle, and affect the labor of your hands. God will get your attention because God is calling for repentance or either repentance or he's going to bring judgment. Many times, saints of God, God is speaking through other patterns and, and guess what? We're not listening. I've been blessed to learn something. When God since there was a riot in Chicago, the Lord sent snow in that region and when he sent snow, the snow called everybody to calm down. And everybody relaxed. And the nation received a temperament. Pussy uses weather pattern. And I believe by faith, he's speaking to us right now. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 38 talks about that. How a drought is upon the land. Drought upon the nation, drought upon the ministry, drought upon the finances, drought upon the health, drought upon the family. Every one of you, sons of God, whether you have your own business or whether you have your own ministry, think about the drought. Is there a shortage here? We may justify things by saying, well, you know, maybe the older saints are dead. They used to give so much money, you know, and, and we're trying to survive. No, God is getting your attention, and I'm going to show you why in a few minutes, why he's getting your attention. Because you're going to use that drought to bring a transformation. <laughs> Let's keep going here. Amos chapter 3, verse 6. Amos chapter 3, verse 6. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people be not afraid? Look what it says. Shall there be evil in a city, and the little one have not done it? Look at 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 2. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying. Okay? Verse 3. Get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Sharif. So I'm going to say brook Sharif. That is before Jordan. So the word of the Lord came to Elijah to give him specific directions. How many of you know that the Bible tells us in all thy ways to acknowledge him? Many times we get hurt in getting financial loans. Many times we get hurt in the relationships. Many times we get hurt and even find the wrong ministerial place because we did not acknowledge God first. We was looking at that situation in the natural. Look what it says right here, saints of God. Elijah did not move. He prophesied, but he did not move until he heard the direction of the Lord. 
Elijah was being used with the prophetic anointing, with the prophet's office, with the world as a welfare prophet. But guess what? Even though he was anointed and he was being used, but God had another step for him. He had another level for him. Look what it says here. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah, giving him specific directions. Elijah did not move from the place of the drought. Elijah did not transition from the place of that drought until he received directions. Look at someone and say, I must learn to receive directions from God before I make a move. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. What is the Hebrew word for acknowledge? Yada. Yada means to know. Yada means to learn to know. Yada means to perceive. Yada means to find out and discern. It means to know by experience, and it means to know and hear God's voice. We must make up our minds, saints, that we're not going to make a move until we yada. Should I transition to this city? Yada. Should I marry this man? He looks like an Egyptian. Yada. Should I profit this financial loan? Yada. Should I stay in the ministry where I am? Yada. You are in a season of transition. And you must discern your season of transition, your time of transition, or you're going to miss it. My God, I'm bubbling here. Bubbling, bubbling, bubbling up. Or you're going to miss the visitation of the Lord that he has for you. Woo! Man. I feel that. Elijah did not transition out of fear until he yada before he moved. Now, this is good. Many mistakes have been made because people don't yada, they don't discern or find out whether to hear God's voice. Daddy, you were right. That man hurt me. I was shacking with him, and he don't want to work. He don't even want a job. Did you yada, sweetheart? No, daddy, I didn't yada. But you need to learn to yada, baby. You know, when you yada, you hear God. Hmm? About the unemployable and the non-negotiable. Look what he says. The book Sharif. Now, Elijah was already being used of God. He was prophesying, being used prophetically, but he heard the voice of the Lord that caused him to move in a direction toward the what? The book Sharif. Now, what is the book Sharif? The Hebrew word for the book Sharif means to cut off. God will send you when there's a drought in the land. God had to send the prophet to a place where he can cut that prophet off from everything, cut him off, cut him down. I live in public view. When it made a place of being of God, even though he was already being used, when that drought comes, God is trying to get your attention. He's trying to get your attention, but you're not listening. Listen to this. Sharif is a hiding place where he gets you where he can talk to you. Elijah might have been a man, oh, I'm anointed, I promise I. God is trying to get him to a place where he can do some cutting. The word it says the Hebrew word, it means to cut up, to, to cut down, get you out of public view, take you to a place where, 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 where even though you went once you to a place where God can speak to you. Now, these are steps that God uses. Look what it says here. So, a place that was a book. A place that was a ravine. In the urban dictionary, they call it a, a big ditch. 
Wait a minute, God. I'm prophesying to the nations. I'm prophesying in public view. I prophesied a drought. Here's the drought. You're moving me to a ditch, to a ravine. You're moving me to a book where you can talk to me alone, where you can cut me off from public view. Why are you sending me there, Father? So I can discipline you more because you think you arrived. The Bible said the gifts were, yes, bring you before great men, but the Lord says, I have some more work to do for with you, to discipline you, to strip you away. Hello, saints of God. Sharif is a place to separate you from the real. Sharif is a place where you have no obedience to Jehovah. Sharif is a place where you move away from the real. Sharif is a place where you have no the food that you like to eat. You, you don't have that kind of food. Done no more. Come on, saints of God. God wants to get you to a place where he can talk to you, saints of God. You don't have no chicken. Come on, the caviar. Come on, no buffet. He got you in a big ditch. You're standing there. I'm a prophet, Lord. But he got you to a place where he can talk to you. Somebody's transitioning, somebody's transitioning, somebody's here transitioning, somebody's confused whether they need to relocate to this city or to that city, somebody's transitioning, what do I need to take this employment here? God, you need to hear directions. Oh, this is getting good here. Look at that. Truth there's a place where you won't be able to do what you want to do. Because he got you in a place where he can work on you. Hello, saints of God. I can see the Lord right now with some giant Holy Ghost scissors stripping you, putting you, picking you down because you thought you had arrived. The Book Sharif is a place where you learn the lesson of loneliness and isolation. But I'm a prophet. I have to have a woman. No, you have to have me, son. I have you in isolation. I have you in obscurity. I have you in that place where I can restructure you and reprogram and download your thinking. Why are you bringing me to the book, Sharif? Because I'm about to do a great move, a great work, a strange act. I'm about to do something for the world, and I'm not going to let you just come in with that prophetic mantle. I'm going to strip you that when you come in under this end-time harvest, you will be afraid to sleep in the lap of Delilah, but you will love me so much that you will walk in obedience. Wow. Come on, saints of God. Sharif, you're face to face with God. Isn't that good? Sharif, you're not with Pastor Jack Frost, First Church of the Deep Freeze. And everybody in there, icicles and, and isotopes and popsicles, the frozen chosen. Because God is pulling you away from that. Come on, saints. Talk to me here. We need to hear this word tonight. A place of preparation for a greater glory. Come on, saints. I hear it all the time. I want that glory, Father. I want it glory. Well, you can, well listen, well, God has to give you some direction to put you in a big ditch, to put you in a ravine, to put you in a book where well, we can do some restructuring you. Listen to what it says here. The book Sharif, I wrote this down, is like a military boot camp. This is what the prophet had to go through. A place where, where you be prepared for war. A place where you're away from home and you're in a hiding place. A place where you are full discipline. A place of, of unending work, regimental training, cold fear, loneliness. A place where, where, where you can begin to be equipped and stripped before a transformation can take place. That's what's wrong with me and the right now in America. Oh, Father, there's a drought. I'm about to lose the ministry. If there's a drought, I got to get out of here. No. 
could be trying to say to you, because of the child, I'm getting your attention so I can pull you into the books away and I can talk to you and strip you some more before I release this entire harvest, you'll be ready. This is what he's saying. It says here, separation from the world. In the military, you'll be obedient to your superiors, your supervisors. That's what the book Sharif does. Next ministry you get into, if God shifts you, or if he keeps you in place, you, you will know what obedience is all about. Yes, sir, supervisor. Walk in obedience. You'll be disciplined. How many of you listening to me? All right, listen to this. 1 Kings 17, verse 4. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. And I have commanded ravens to do it, to feed thee there. Isn't that amazing? Ravens are blackbirds. Ravens are scavengers. Is that right? God commanded the ravens to do it. Bring the prophet but meat, meat and bring it. If a raven is a scavenger, as I said earlier, Elijah got some wool kill. It was a place where God stripped him. It was a place where God provided provision. It was a place where there was no red lobster. Especially by faith. It was a place, hello, saints of God, where there was no long John Silver. It was a place where there was no Kool Aid or, or no, no plum granny juice. Hello, saints. It was a place, now I'm going there, there wasn't no cognac. Well, no whiskey. Well, no wine. We will serve no wine before it's time. It was a place where it was only you and Jehovah. Hear me out, saints. Oh, the drought in my health, the drought in my finance, the drought in my marriage. Oh, the drought, the drought. I have to run somewhere else. Don't run. It's the voice of the Lord. What is God about to do with you in this next transition? Come on, saints of God. Look at 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 6. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. Now watch this. He drank water from the brook. All right, now, first thing, the word of the Lord. The second thing, he received direction to go to Brook Sharif, and at the Brook Sharif, God provided the only provision that he wanted him to have. All right? Look at Leviticus chapter 11, verse 13 and 15. Leviticus chapter 11, look at verses 13 and 15. Verse 13, these shall you have an abominations among the birds. They shall not be eaten. Ravens, the abomination, the eagle and the osprey and the osprey. And verse 14, the vulture and the kite after his kind. Look at verse 15. And every raven, every raven after his what kind, every raven after his kind. The Lord calls ravens detestable birds. He calls them unclean birds. Ravens are scavengers. Ravens will eat anything. Hear me out, says of God. Jehovah to use our detestable bird to provide provision for his people. Hear me say, Jehovah provided bread and room kill twice a day. But that's all he needed. Come on, saints of God. How many of you know that some of us need to downsize? Hello, I confess. Is that right? Some of us need to get away from that bravery, I confess. So you can hear the voice of the Lord. So you can hear direction from the Lord. Listen, if God are doing a place for you, trust him. I hear my story. There's been some of you sitting here. The Lord says, go to that hotel and stay there and seek my faith for three days. I didn't go to no hotel if I spend my money for another three days. Come on, saints. He's speaking, but you're not listening. Stop looking at the drought. Stop looking at the judgment. 
Look and see what type of transformation that God is trying to do with you or what he's trying to do with the ministry or what he's trying to do with your health or with your relationship. Come on, saints of God. Don't transition out of fear. Come on. If you move, try to operate out of fear, you're going to miss the move of a season of transition. When transitioning, fear. You must remember the Our Father prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven. How many of you know that? Yes. Does anybody know that? Uh -huh. Amen. Brother, you're a candidate for the Brooks Reef. <laughs> My boss said I'm already there. <laughs> How many of you know we can have fun in the Lord? Is that right? All right. Thank you, man. man thank you. you. You're a good man. All right. First Kings chapter 17, verse 7. Something happened. And it came to pass after a while that the book dried up. Uh-oh. The book dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Okay, here we have a drought, a prophesied drought. Here we have God telling the prophet to, to, to relocate, to, to, to transition. Is that right? I want you to go to a big ditch, a ravine, where I can strip you. I can transform you because I have a greater message of anointing for you. Is that right? And a greater move of God, okay, for you that will begin to manifest. All right. Then after that, while he was there, he sent ravens to feed him, the prophet. The next thing we have, all of a sudden now, God is supposed to be providing provision. The book dried up. Look what it says. Elijah saw the flow of the book drying up while in hiding, while in obscurity, while in isolation, while going through a transformation. And notice now, God is right there all the time. How many of you know that God works in the darkness? Many times when we see darkness, we think that God is nowhere around. How many of you are with me, saints? When God came into the, when the light, when, when Solomon had uh, built the temple and they had dedicated the temple, the Lord came, one of the manifestations that God came into the temple was a black cloud. The Bible said darkness is what? Under his feet. God will manifest his presence through blackness. Many times I hear people say, I don't hear God. I don't. God is right there. He's listening. He's right there. But you are panicking and you are not seeking his face. All right? Elijah is coming into a drought now. He's coming into a dry spell, a dry season by the big ditch or by the ravine. Notice something that the Lord is doing with this prophet. Step by step circumstances. God is, is moving him what? Step by step. Step by step. I see people get so angry. Get, well, God told me that he was going to make my business blessed. You know, and then all of a sudden, here comes a drought. <laughs> well, God could be using that drought in your business to bring about a transformation, man. No, saints of God. To strip you, Bubba. <laughs> yes, that's what he's doing. The Lord was carrying Elijah through another trial called testing. Look at somebody say testing. How many of you know there are times when God will test you, but your emotions will get frustrated? Is that right? We have gotten more telephone calls this year. People say, I'm mad with God. <clears throat> I'm angry with God. And I asked them, I said, out of love to you, what are you going to do about it? You can't box him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just need to go along with the program, seek his face, fall in love with him, and submit to his authority. Is that right? All right. Elijah's faith was again in the world. In the balances, all of a sudden the book should read dry up. You ain't got no water, man. All right, first Corinthians 3 13. I want everybody to please write this down because this applies to every one of you because you're in a season of transition. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. 
for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, revealed by fire, and the fire shall test every man's work, whatever sort it is. You love your Mercedes, you love your vehicle more than God, the Lord says, I will send a fire to test to see where your heart is. No, saints, you love that house more than you love him, the Lord says, I will send a fire to test that house, to try that house, to declare what's in your heart. Come on, saints. Every man's work shall be declared by fire. What is an idol to you? What is he spending more time with than spending with the Father? I can understand why God said, I'm going to test my prophet some more. I'm going to try him because the book is drying up. I'm going to see if he's going to work out and run or if he's going to leave me because I'm testing him by fire. How many of you know fire is hot? And when fire starts burning, it, it, listen, say, when God sends a fire, oh my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Every man's work shall be revealed by fire. The Lord says, I will send a fire. The Greek word for. Isn't that something? P-O-O-R. For. I will send a fire. A fire of fire. I will send lightning. I am going to try every man's work. I look at some Greek words here. It means a fire will come to test you. There's a fire coming to examine, to prove, to scrutinize. And guess what, saints? Hear me out, please. The fire is coming to identify if you are genuine. Oh, my God. Oh, you're not going to be able to fake it here in a minute. Somebody talk to me here. You're not going to be able to fake it because that fire is going to burn. It's going to test who you are. You Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, burn, baby, burn. God is going to see the real video. Somebody give me a napkin. Uh, honey, would you bring me a napkin? My eyes are being tested by fire. I got water running on my eyes here. That's okay. Thank you so much. I'm in the Brookshire Reef up here right now. Okay. I'm going through a transformation. Okay? All right. The Brookshire Reef drying up. Will you fall apart and run, or will you stay rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ? All right, here's the moral of the story. Something's coming to test you. Something's coming to try you. I hear people say, the harvest is coming. I'm going to be part of this move. See where you are. When you, if you get out of the brook, you're going to up. Let's see what the pastor test at the brook shore. When that fire comes to burn, we'll see if you're a genuine man. Your business drying up. I'm going again. Your health drying up. Brook Shore drying up. Your business drying up. Your health drying up. Your marriage drying up. She don't love me anymore. Uh, she told me she wouldn't come into the Brook Shore. Your friendship's drying up. Good. You might not need them to know it because they weren't really friends. They clean their... <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, you're drying up the drought. The books you read is drying up. Now you stand there in a quite drowned screen bed. You stand in there lonely. And isolated. But God is still with you. How many of you hear me saying? He's still with you. So come on, give Jesus a praise. So what do you do now? Well, the Lord is trying to take you to another level. A next step. He's trying to take you to another level. A next step of provision. But you got to pass the test. You can't get mad and quit. Look what it says. First King 17, verse 8, and the word of the Lord came to him saying, notice Elijah would not move until he had heard from God. He would not make a move until he received directions. First Kings chapter 17, look at the last verse, verse 9. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, place of provision, 
Get thee to Zarephath. Zarephath means, means in Hebrew, a smelting place, a city. Elijah had been through the cutting. Now he was going through a melting place. <laughs> Where well, God was continually molding him into the man of God that he wanted him to be. Go, saints, arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman, and what shall she do? She shall what? Sustain thee. All right, now let me bless you something. Give me a few minutes here. This is a short message, not that long. Let me bless you again, and ending with what I have. How do you know when you're in a season of transition? <laughs> How do you know when you're in a season of transition? Okay. This author says something very powerful. I believe there is a time when God opens up doors for transition for us. A time to test you. A time to try you. A time to pull you away from the world. A time to get you alone by yourself where he can speak to you when all, all around you is doing what? Falling apart. And should you remain unaware of how life is moving, you might miss the move of God if you don't hear the directions of God and pursuing him. Okay, number one, transitions begins with a word from the Lord. You don't move until you hear from the Lord. Should I move to Oklahoma? Should I move to Chickamauga, Texas? Should I move to Alabaster, Mississippi? You don't move in the season of transition until you hear the word of the Lord. Because God may have you to stay in the Brooks Reef. Because God is trying to do a work with that brook. All right? Look at what it says. Number one, transition ends with a word from the Lord. This is what? Very important. Number two, before you make a transition, recognize that God will provide or seek his face. God, if I make this move, will you provide for me? But you have to know that you know that you know that you know that you have a relationship with God and that he, and you know that wherever you transition to, he's going to take care of you. All right? That's number two. Hold on with me. Hold on with me here. God will take care of you. He will provide provisions if you have to send some black ravens. And you got to believe in your heart by faith. He will feed me. Hello, saints of God. How many of you are listening to me? All right. God will provide for you if he had to use an old widow woman. God will provide for you even when the book dried up and you don't know what to do no more because all the finances are in a drought. Because when you transition and opportunities and portals and doors start opening up, you know then that God is with you. Isn't that something? All right, write it down, say some God. I'm giving you some, some areas here to look at. All right, and that was the last one. <laughs> Three. All right. You are in a season of transition. You must find out from God. You must hear from God. And listen, before you make any kind of move, you must hear from God. And many of you I want to say, and I'm going to close, get ready for the Brook Sharif. Because some of us are going to be tried and tested to see if we're genuine. How many of you are listening to me? Well, God is using me now, brother. Well, God has something greater ahead of us. But he's going to have to take you through a transformation before he can use you. 
That applies to what? Myself also. Okay? If you were blessed by what you heard, you were in a season of transition. The sons of Issachar understood the times. They knew what Israel wanted to do. If you were blessed by that, give Jesus a praise. Come on, come on, come on. We're not going to prolong the time much, but I just want to minister in the area of come, come on, honey, medications. A lot of I've been getting a lot of calls lately. People have been taking bad medications, poisonous type medications, and they need a detox. And some people are, are worse off than what they were. And we just we don't want to prolong the time much, but we just want to minister in the area of drugs and and certain medications. Okay. All right. All right. Everybody repeat as we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Father, we ask you to forgive us if we have hurt anyone or wounded anyone. Father, we hold, Father, we hold no bitterness, no, no resentment, or no unforgiveness toward anybody living or dead. Father, we, we decree healing. We desire the Holy Spirit will move, move through the atmosphere here and, and set us free in the name of Jesus. Father, we want no part of this big pharma medicine. Father, we want to be free in the Lord, and we want to be healed by you in the name of Jesus. All right, right now, and then we're going to move quickly. I bind right now in the name of Jesus. I command demons to the Tylenol. Tylenol, come on, Tylenol is damaging a lot of kidneys. I command, come on, demon spirits connected with Tylenol and Advil and pain medications. Come out, come out, come out of you now in Jesus' name. Come on, come on, saints, come on, bring them out. Come on, out of there, Tylenol, Advil, Pain medications come out now in Jesus Christ's name. Come on, come on. That's right. Come on, come on out of there now in Jesus' name. I come against sleep medication. I come against sleep medications. Go in the name of Jesus. I come against heart medication, medication for your heart. Come out of there now in Jesus' name. Irregular heartbeat. Yeah, come on, irregular heartbeat. Come on, come on out of there now in the name of Jesus. Our blood pressure medication. Blood pressure medication. Someone got mad at me recently because I told them that they're using serpent, uh, 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 serpent venom. You can look it up yourself in a lot of uh, the high blood pressure medication. All right, come on. Come on, I command any type of serpent venom to come out of your bodies right now from high blood pressure medications. Come on, out of there now. Out of there now in Jesus Christ's name. Come on, saints, breathe those things out of there. Let them go. I come muscle relaxers. Come on, excellent morphine is another one. It affects the bones. It affects the ligaments. It affects the joint. Well, come on out of there now in Jesus' name. All right, my favorite word for stubborn spirits is cough one time. Come on, cough. Go. Advil, Tylenol, pain medication, heart medication. Go. Go, go, heart medication, go. Sleeping pills, muscle relaxers, go. Go, come on out of there now in Jesus Christ's name. I come on, blood pressure, blood pressure medication, go in Jesus Christ's name. I come against medication that cause stroke, that cause seizures, that cause cancer in your body. Come on, come on, come on out of there now. When you look at television now, what they say, this medication causes stroke, it causes seizure. This medication, come on, saints, they call aneurysm. Why would you want to take it? Come on out of there now. Come on. Out of there now. Out of there now. Out of there now in the name of Jesus. Go, go, go in Jesus' name. Go, go, go in Jesus' name. Okay, I got it. Come on. I could come against right now. Addiction to drugs. Addiction to drugs. I bind the spirit of Apollo and Apollyon. Come on. Drugs. Go in Jesus' name. Craving for nicotine. Cigarettes. Oh, come on. Come on. Out of there now. Cigarettes. Nicotine. Sell them. Camels, I don't know if they even make them anymore. Come on out of there now. Camels, go, go, go in Jesus' name. Come on, be the about say, craving for nicotine, go in Jesus' name. Cigarette from Akaya, nicotine, go in Jesus' name. Uh, in the Jewish uh, uh, camps, they use nicotine to, 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 to murder uh, some of the Jewish people in trains. Come on, come on, come on, go, go, nicotine, go 
in the name of Jesus. I come against right now uppers, downers, barbiturates, go, go, uppers, downers, barbiturates, go, speed, crystal meth, come on, come on, I'll go now. I'll break that off of you now in the name of Jesus. Fantasy spirits, go in Jesus' name. Come on, fantasy, go in Jesus' name. I come against tranquilizers. Tranquilizers, go, go, go. Some of you receiving medication, tranquilizers from the doctor, go in Jesus' name. Methadone, mind control, antidepressants. Methadone, mind control, antidepressants, go in Jesus' name. Fear of Barbital. Fear of Barbital, come on. Fear of Barbital, go in Jesus' name. Anxiety, hypnotics, go. Pipe smoking, smack pipe smoking, go in Jesus' name. Come on, bring those things out. Don't look at everybody else, saints. Come on, get your freedom. I come against witchcraft in drugs, witchcraft in medicine, witchcraft in drugs, witchcraft in medicine. Come on, come on, bring those things out now in Jesus' name. Go, go in Jesus' name. I come against sorcery, black magic and medicine, sorcery and black magic and medicine. Go in Jesus' name. Come out of the bloodstream. Come on, come on, out of there now. Out of there now in Jesus' name. I come against the medicine man. The medicine man. That's his name. Come on, medicine man. Come on out of there now. Come on, medicine man. Go. Go in the name of Jesus. Go in the name of Jesus. I come against medication that's affecting your mind. Affecting your mind. Go. 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 Come on. Let him go, saints. Let him go. Beat them out. And these are babe. Thorazine and lithium. One of my sergeants in the military, he started taking thorazine and lithium on the head. He lost his mind. Come on. I come against thorazine. I come against lithium in your body. And I command it to come out of you now in Jesus' name. Go. Go. Go in Jesus' name. Mind boggling drugs. Mind binding drugs. Go. Go. Go in Jesus' name. Anxiety medication. Anxiety medication. Come on. Come on. Anxiety. Mind-altering medication, anxiety medication, mind-altering, go in Jesus' name. Confusion, mind-control aspirin, mind-control aspirin. Come on, saints, breathe them out. Mind-control aspirin, go out of the bloodstream. Come on, let's detox the demons. Go, 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 go. Go, go, go. Come out of there now. In the name of Jesus. I come against having diarrhea to false medication. Diarrhea because of false medication. So come on, psychotic medications. Go, go, go in Jesus' name. I come against narcolepsy, narcolepsy, sleep apnea. Come on, I break the curse of sleep apnea, sleep epilepsy. Go, 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 seizures. Come on, come on, out of there now in the name of Jesus. Come on, let him go, Saint. Hypertension, hypertension, delirium. Hypertension, delirium. Come on, out of there now. We love you. We have a concern for you. What Big Pharma is doing to God's people. Come on, out of there now in Jesus' name. Come on, come on, out of there now in the name of Jesus. Go, neurosis, neurosis, vomiting tremors, vomiting tremors. The Bible says when the land is defiled, it will vomit up to in heaven. Oh, come on, vomit and tremor, tremors. Go, go in Jesus Christ's name. Come on, breathe them out, saints. Let them let those things go. They have no right to you in Jesus' name. All right, diabetes, diabetes. Go in Jesus' name. I come against excessive burning. I come against headaches, diabetes. Come on, the lap on the legs. Go in the name of Jesus. I come against damage to the eyes. Damage to the eyes, damage to the blood vessels. Come on, come on, come on, saints. Come on, give me another call for a time. Come on, come on, out of the mouth. Go, 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 go in Jesus Christ's name. Come on, diabetes, go. Go, go, diabetes, go. Go in Jesus' name. I come against hidden sickness, hidden disease, and hidden infirmity. I command the demons to come out of hiding. Go. Go, go. I lose the fire. I lose the fire of the Holy Spirit. I lose the spirit of judgment. Come on. Here we go. Let's get them started now. Come on. Come on out of right now. Go. 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 Come on out of right now. Go. Go. Go in the name of Jesus. Come on out of right now. Go. Go. Go in the name of Jesus. Go. Go. Bring him out of right now. Go. Go, go in the name of Jesus. Circulatory problems, digestive problems, uh, Hematologic problems, immune system problems, internal organ problems. Come on, come on, break them out now in Jesus' name. Problems in your in, in your internal organs. Go, go in the name of Jesus. Renal problems, skin problems. Go, go urinary problems. Go, go, go urinary, urinary, urinary. Come on, out of there now in Jesus' name. 
nervous problems, prostate, prostate cancer. Come on, come on, prostate, and last prostate, go. Go, go, come on, prostate, go. Go, go, go in Jesus Christ's name. All right. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, there, there. In Jesus Christ's name. That's all we need to do. Praise the Lord. All right, give Jesus a praise. All right. Father, we, we loose upon the people the peace of God. We loose upon the people the joy of the Lord. We loose upon the people healing and deliverance. We loose upon the people the spirit of adoption. We loose upon the people, Father, uh, strength of the immune systems, the circulatory systems. Uh, Father, we pray, Lord, their bone marrow, strength of the, uh, the bone marrow. And we loose upon them Father, a sound mind, a sound mind, a sound mind. And Father, we just give you the praise for their healing. We give you the praise for their deliverance right now in Jesus' name. Now, Father, right now, as they depart from here today, we pray that the holy angels will accompany them and assist them and protect them and shield them as they go forward even into their homes. Father, we bless you. You're a mighty God. You're a wonderful God. You're Jehovah Shammah. You're Jehovah Shalom. You're Jehovah Elohim. We give you praise. We love you so much. We thank you for the healing. We thank you for the deliverance. We thank you for the word that is going forth all this week from all the believers in Jesus Christ's name. If you love the Lord, give him another praise.